my time with the Forest Service and then my time with the BLM, I found that there's this issue of calling it a rangeland. And um, with my, because I cut my teeth on forests and forested land, I had a hard time accepting rangeland and this really came driven home. We were working, I was a assistant manager on the Grand Canyon Parashant National Monument. We were developing our land management plan and I kind of headed up the ecological side of the decision making. And um, we were talking about wildlife. We started out with wildlife and wildlife habitat. And then we brought in the range guys to start talking about grazing. And, and we had made up a list of decisions on eco-regions and brought in and, and um, the, one of the range cons wanted said something about rangeland. We go, well, we're not talking about rangeland. We're talking about ecological regions and habitat. And he's going, it was rangeland a long time before it was habitat. And I kind of. <laughs> So that really drove it home for me that the BLM kind of had a problem with, you know, what the land really is. So that, I just, FYI, that's kind of where I'm coming from on that. So I do, basically, I call them ecosystems, and they are, you know, different kinds of ecosystems. We've already gone through the definition. Eddie provided good definition. And then there's the ecological regions, and um, they're basically driven by landforms and climate. So your Mojave Desert is one ecoregion, ecological region, Sonoran Desert, um, Colorado Plateau, and, and there they are. You can kind of see in the southwest. And, and Arizona, and I have to tell you that there's this Apache Highlands down here. I don't know Apache Highlands. I hadn't heard it before, and um, so I'm going to have to take this map and get out there and go find it and walk around in it so I have a better idea. So I wanted to kind of go back and do a basic of why the federal land management people do what they do. The General Land Office, and I think it was, I forget, Eddie? Somebody said that the BLM came, or maybe it was Russ came from the General Land Office. And it was formed in 1800, um, and it was because of all the land that was put together to make the United States, treaties and buys and et cetera. And it was to dispose of all that land, get it out of the federal management ownership. Fish and Wildlife Service was really the next important one regarding natural resource management, and it was 1871. Forest Service wasn't too far after that, 1881, and a lot of the Forest Service had to do with the fact that they had, they were just, you know, harvesting timber and, you know, grazing like crazy everywhere because anything was fair game. You could do anything anywhere. And there was some big, pretty big fires up in the lake states. And so there was some concern. We had uh, Gifford Pinchot who, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, they sat down together and they came up with the Forest Service. Park Service was a bit later, 1916, and that was initially a lot to do with recreation. Recreational use to the extent that it was even damaging. I mean, it was intense recreation use without regard to anything else. The Grazing Service didn't come along until 1934, and that was because there was such intense grazing everywhere in the West. And there were between, especially between sheep and cattle owners, there was, there was starting to be some serious problems. Um, then in 1946, the Department of Interior um, was having problems with that grazing service. So they put them together with the General Land Office and they called it the BLM. And it's, you know, we've heard of the Bureau of, La of Livestock Management, the Bureau of Livestock and Mines, um, the Bureau of Loose Money. Um, but anyway, they still had the same mandate as they did back in 1800 and then in 1934. Basically, graze it until you get rid of it. And it was still get rid of it. So then, um, along those same lines, there's some very important laws, some very important federal legislation that was passed um, to help focus what was to be done on all of that land. The Taylor Grazing Act is the Bible to the force, or to the BLM, excuse me. 
Um, still, to this day, it's the Bible of the BLM. Um, then in 1969, the National Environmental Policy Act was um, signed. Actually, it wasn't signed until January 1st, 1970, but all of us who have acted under it used it, call it 1969. The Clean Water Act, and I'm not going to talk about that, but that was Nixon. NEPA was Nixon. The Endangered Species Act was Nixon. And then FLIPMA, which is um, the, the new mandate for BLM, was actually signed by Ford, but it was developed under Nixon. So Nixon was one of the most environmentally sensitive presidents, and that just kind of is <laughs> So the Taylor Grazing Act, which really drives how the BLM manages livestock grazing, Outside of the national forests, so the outside of the Forest Service, homesteading and unrestricted livestock use on public domain lands continued unabated until the passing of the Taylor Grazing Act, which directed the Secretary of the Interior to stop injury to the public grazing lands by preventing overgrazing. The Secretary, Secretary created the Division of Grazing and renamed it the Grazing Service, and he made regional graziers to be kind of complement the Forest Service Regional Forester. So my title is Regional Grazier. Um, like the Forest Service, the Grazing Service was established to bring order from social chaos and to impose some controls on the grazing. Because it was ugly out there, and it really was. They, it, the land was just, I apologize for the clarity there. The land was denuded, it was abused. The Taylor Grazing Act um, passed in 1934 to stop injury to the public lands by preventing overgrazing, soil deterioration, and to provide for orderly use, improvement, and development to stabilize the livestock in industry. That is a really important part of that, to stabilize that industry. The law was a little late. By the time that act was passed, um, the range productivity had been depleted by two-thirds. So the the overall integrity of the land had already, its ability to produce biological material, i.e. vegetation, had been depleted by two thirds. So that's pretty serious. Because you, when we get to talking about sustainability, the development of soil, and when I was in the Forest Service, we really never considered it to be sustainable. You don't lose your soil productivity. You just don't do it. And um, it was already on the, on these lands was depleted by two thirds. And you know, it's in a dry, arid region, it's a brittle ecosystem. It doesn't have the ability to um, respond and recover because it's so stinking dry. In 1946, when the BLM was born, um, they were still having trouble with the grazing service. So they put it together with the general land office um, BLM got both of them with, with both of their missions. So the grazing service mission was to regulate grazing on the public domain lands, while um, the general land office mission was to dispose of those lands. The conflicting mandates of land disposal and grazing regulation contributed to a very schizophrenic nature that remains today. <laughs> and it does remain today. When I went from the Forest Service in two, 2000 to the BLM, I couldn't understand how they were organized. Like you had this part of the office over here, this is for renewable resources, and this part of the office over here, that side was for non-renewable resources. So soils was stuck over there with mining and land disposal, um, land permits to, for filming and you know all that stuff. And then you had your biologist and your range cons over on this side. And I'm going, I don't understand this. How do you develop an interdisciplinary or a kind of you know, integrated decision making when you're separated that way? It, you know, it kind of seemed weird. So I went to their enabling legislation, which wasn't passed until 76, and I read it to see, maybe I can figure out why they're organized this way by understanding what their mission is. I finished reading their mission, 
And I came back and go, these guys are schizophrenic. You know, they're not organized to do their job. So in 69, NEPA was passed. NEPA was um, big for the Forest Service. Um, it requires federal agencies to integrate environmental values into their decision making. Um, this stewardship legislation, um, didn't, the BLM didn't believe it applied to them because they weren't to, to take care of the land, they were to graze it and get rid of it. They had no sustainability in any of their legislation. So, um, so they just ignored it, 1969, where the Forest Service struggled and tripped and fell and tried to figure out how to, how to really, you know, comply with that legislation. Um, it mandates the public participation, but as been has said by many of the speakers before, the sheer volume and the size and complexity of NEPA process and the documents results in citizens just opting out because it's just too complex, confusing, big. Um, the law was to be applied to any federal, state, or local project that uses federal funding, involves work on federal lands, or involves work performed by the federal government. So it did apply to the BLM, but the BLM just um, refused to admit it and just kept grazing until they got rid of it. Um, the Endangered Species Act of 73, and I found that this was interesting, that the Supreme Court found that the plain intent of Congress in this act was to halt and reverse the trend towards species extinction, whatever the cost. I never really knew that until I was researching to put this program together, whatever the cost, that's pretty incredible. So FLIPMA, 1976, the National Forests mandate was updated with what was called NFMA, the National Forest Management Act. And it had some stipulations about how to do this, that, and the other thing as far as managing timber. The BLM at the same time got their first ecological environmental mandate. And their legislated mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the public lands for the use and enjoyment of present and future generations. Um, that was 76. So they'd gone from 1800 as the general land office get rid of it until 1976, 176 years having a mission. So they went through generations and generations. And in 76, they got this legislation. Well, they were pretty ingrained in what they were to do and how they were gonna do it by, by this time. So when I read FLIPMA, when I got to the BLM in 2000, I went, they're not organized by grazing and mining over here to, to sustain the health and diversity productivity. They're not organized at all, but that was the best they could do given their history. They just, you know, they weren't there yet. Um, but they could be, it's, but I think it's gonna take, well, they have 76, that's 24 plus 13, 37 years. I think it's probably gonna take another generation or two because they're pretty ingrained in what, what they're doing and how they do it. They really are. Um, I pushed real hard from the inside, and you're gonna see there's a lot of similarities between my presentation and Greta's um, without us even talking to each other about it, but I was pushing from the inside and she was pushing from the outside to, to accomplish basically the same thing, get them to do what they're supposed to do. Um, so maybe in another generation or two, maybe with new blood, I mean, new blood with people that have a head on their shoulders and a fire in their belly to get on the inside and, and keep pushing. And also those who like help with the, those nonprofit organizations, get a hold of their letters, write your own letter, but you know, get your voice heard because people from the outside are listened to a lot more than people from the inside. I'll, I'll tell you that for sure. So they were supposed to no longer graze it until it's disposed of. Therefore, the schizophrenia should have been cured, but that wasn't so. And you know, this is 
this is kind of where I worked up there on the Arizona Strip. But it all burned up. They had a good rain, had a good wet winter in 2004, 2005. 2005, hundreds of thousands of acres burned because this is full of non-native cheatgrass, or this is actually red brome and bromus tectorum. But um, had we burned up a lot of land in 2005, 2006. So it doesn't even have the land up there. Critical towards habitat doesn't even have these native sh few shrubs, although a lot of this looks like tumbleweed, which is another um, product from Eurasia. So one of the um, things to me that is very near and dear and is very, very important on, on arid lands throughout the world is biological soil crusts. There is one place on the Arizona Strip where I know there's some formation starting, but and I call that place Gaeta up to my butt because it is so productive. The Gaeta comes up to here. The Joshua trees are at least 30 feet tall and bigger the round than this. I mean, that place is, um, hasn't been grazed in about 50 years. I digress. <laughs> These soil crusts are composed of cyanobacteria, green algae, brown algae, fungi, lichens, and mosses. They're found in arid regions around the world. They're important members of the desert and contribute, contribute to the well-being of other plants, um, stabilizing sand and dirt, promoting moisture retention, and fixing nitrogen. Nitrogen can't be up, taken up by plants until it has been fixed. Just That's close enough. So here's a piece of desert that's got some pretty good biotic soil crusts. It's kind of a close-up. There's nothing for scale, so I don't know how big it is, but that's what it looks like. They play a really important role because they're concentrated right in the top of the soil. They affect processes that occur at that air-soil interface. Um, this is, includes soil stability and erosion. Besides wind blowing barren soil around, and you do get a, a lot of wind, especially in the Mojave. Well, I've seen some dust throw, blow through Phoenix on occasion, too. Um, it also, sto soil stability, the um, kinetic force of raindrop impact displaces a tremendous amount of soil. So if you don't have something to hold that soil there, it gets displaced. And gen generally, when it rains, like um, Nancy did the, did the climatic, Thing. Um, when we get a storm, it's a deluge, and you just get your soil is is just splashing all over, and then all you've got is runoff, and so then the soil just starts to go. So that's the the soil erosion has two components: it's got wind and water. The nitrogen fixation, which is definitely a productivity thing, um, that's a, that's another reason that after before the Taylor Grazing Act, and even after that um, with the crust gone, the, that the productivity was so reduced. Um, and then the nutrient contributions to the plants, the soil plant water relations, that crust holds a lot of water that can't be held without the crust. You know, we talked about the evaporation in, um, in the desert exceeds infiltration. Well, the, this really reduces transpiration. transpiration. Um, seedling germination and plant growth. I'm, a, I'm kind of a fan of crusts, if you can't tell. <clears throat> this is what you get when you don't have crusts. I mean, it's, I'm sure this was taken on the Arizona Strip. Um, studies of how crusts affect plant health is clear cut. And they've shown in survival or nutrient content in those environments is, is definitely different. Nut um, nutrients are shown to increase in plant tissues um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, ion, calcium, magnesium, magnesium, all, all the base cations, all the nutrients that are port, important to plant growth. Here's another picture. And the, you know, I told you about my, um, my little place called Gaeta up to my butt. In there, you can see the difference in the color and vigor of the creosote in the, um, in the Joshua trees. You can see there's, there's even a difference in the composition of your small shrubs 
and definitely the amount of grass. I better, um, you guys getting tired of crusts yet? I'm, you know, okay. Crusts are well adapted to severe growing conditions, but poorly adapted to compressional disturbances. Domestic livestock grazing, uh, recreational activities, especially ATVs, and military activities, especially out by Las Vegas, place a heavy toll on the integrity of the crust. Disruption brings decreased organism diver brings decreased diversity, nutrients, stability, and organic matter. The two places in the soil that hold the base cations, which are so important to plant growth, are in the organic matter and in clay. And out here in the desert, we don't have much clay. We've got mostly sand. So those crusts, the organic matter, is so important to holding nutrients on site for plant growth. And um, I don't remember this one on the strip, but I'm sure it must be there. Other disturbance impacts are indirect. The several plants have the ability to um, diminish the growth of other plants around them. And several for, or desert plants have this ability to suppress the um, growth of other plants so that they have their area where they can catch any rain that comes down and the other plants aren't there to take that up because a good chunk of those roots are up here in the surface to catch that rain if it comes. So actions that also actions that increase the shrub component, such as excessive grazing, can have an unexpected impact on crusting, uh, crust functions um, because the, the shrub component is is much greater, generally speaking, in grazed area because your grass is gone. And so your, your soil crust interaction, if you have any crust, is real different. This is today. This isn't um, 1930. This is today in our deserts and our rangelands. But this is the Mojave Desert. And um, studies of trampling disturbance have noted that the loss of the moss, lichen, and cyanobacteria um, can be severe. Runoff can increase by half, and the rate of soil loss can increase six times without apparent damage to vegetation. So once you lose that crust, you can have tremendous reduction in its productivity, but you can still have your plants, your larger plants, on the surface. Um, disturbance to soil surfaces in arid regions can lead to large soil losses and reduced overall productivity. I can harp on this as much as I want, I, you know, forever, but I've harped on it when we were developing our plan, and you won't see it mentioned anywhere in the plan, even though it is a major component, or should be, of these desert ecosystems. This is a system that um, is in pretty good condition on the Arizona Strip, but there's no crust there. They've managed, managed it to kind of get some grass species back. And so they're saying that this is in really good condition, but it has no crust. So it doesn't, it can't function as it should. Um, Greta went over this in, pretty, in pretty good detail. So I'm not going to, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. And of the species considered, the evidence for adverse impacts is most prevalent for bighorn sheep, and, and Greta pointed that out. I'm sitting in the back laughing and going, God, I just said every, everything she said, I'm saying. So here's some ecological regions. That's a little bit fuzzy, but you can see, and this is tortoise habitat, the, um, that's the Mojave, and this coming down here is the Sonoran. So um, basically, ecoregions and ecosystems are, it's not rangeland. Rangeland wasn't here before anything else. The cows might have been here before anybody could recognize what was going on. And I don't know where rangeland came from, because I kind of cruised through the 1934 Taylor Grazing Act, and I couldn't find it in there, but. I think the BLM made it up somewhere along the line, and, and it's definitely stuck. It's in all of the policy documents, everywhere in anything about policy coming down from the Washington office. 
It's all called rangeland. It's not called forests. It's not called Mojave. It's not called, it's rangeland. So the impacts on desert tortoise, it was um, in the, I think, late 70s that a study was um, sponsored by the Bureau of Land Management out on the Beaver Dam Slope, which is down by Mesquite, but in Arizona, um, to see what are the, the overlaps between forage for cattle and forage for tortoise. This is... Um, BLM and Arizona Game and Fish sponsored this one. So an analysis of the food habits um, shows that red brome and a rhodium, which is the little stork's bill, um, are the two exotic annuals are now the dominant food for those tortoise. Um, native grass, uh, bunch grass, perennial bunch grass is no longer a major source of food it, as it was earlier because it's basically been grazed out of the system. Perennial grasses are the highest preferred food for both tortoise and livestock, even though these grasses now compromise a very minor portion of the plant community. The declining populations of tortoise um, are attributed mostly to the effects of competition with livestock with predation and collection. I don't think there's too much collection going on anymore because they are so few and far between. I've spent hours and hours and hours out there in the Mojave Desert and I've maybe seen a half dozen, maybe. And only one that wasn't on a road that I did I just come across when I was laying out a fence line. So the livestock compete directly for the forage and this species is a listed, federally listed species, sensitive species, and its, its population is definitely a lot less, <coughs> excuse me, than it was in the 40s. But I have to tell you that fish and wildlife, and I apologize if I am offending anyone here, have changed their monitoring protocol every year. So you cannot compare temporally if there's been any increase or any decrease because they've changed their protocol every time so there's no comparison that can be made scientifically. I'm going to have to digress here again because I want to tell you that the size of plot that it takes and the number of plot that it takes to monitor not only tortoise numbers and tortoise demographics but just vegetation is a pretty good size. And there is not one BLM office and neither Mojave nor the Sonoran Desert that is collecting adequate data to be able to tell you anything about their vegetation. So every time they collect data and they go back and compare, it's all the same. So they say no change, no change, no change. So everything's fine. Nothing is digressing. Well, their sample size is so small that they would never be able to detect any change even if we put sprinklers out there. These guys are pretty amazing. Um, we had big fires 2005, 2006. I'm, I go out there to see as a system monument manager what, 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 and I'm just, I'm appalled. I just look and it's clear to the horizon. All I can see is thousands of acres of burned critical tourist habitat. I come back in, I start going through the literature. Nada, nada, as a forester, as a civiculturist, the art and science of growing trees, that's civiculture, I knew what to do. If it was a forest, I knew what to do. Um, my master's in applied forest ecology, but on the desert, I didn't know what to do, and there was nothing, nothing in the literature. So these guys have been grazing the Mojave Desert since the early 1800s, and there's no studies, and I'm about out of time. Okay. Um, Indirect adverse effects due to grazing are manifested by changes in plant community and structure um, and the exotic of, of these non-native plants. And these, these cheatgrass is called cheatgrass because it takes advantage of late fall rain and germinates. And it sits there and just waits through the freezing cold winter. And as soon as there's some spring moisture, 
it goes. So it takes, it takes advantage of any spring moisture before anything else can take advantage of it. And so by June, if you've had spring moisture, which only comes about once every 10 years, you can have cheatgrass or brome up to here and it's dry as a bone by June. And then it burns and it burns your native vegetation, which did not develop with fire and cannot even hang in there. It just, you know, it kills your native vegetation. And then you just converted the whole thing to a cheatgrass monoculture. Um, I pre uh, apologize for the blurriness, but I didn't have fast enough film speed to catch these guys because they're so quick. Okay, food in the desert tortoise consists of grass forbs, parts of shrubs, um, and sand and small gravel. So when they did this study, they were looking at the fecal matter of the cows and of the tortoise and the um, fragments of carnivore scats. And like I think it was Greta said that, yeah, they were, someone had seen one or did a fecal study and found some cow poop in there. Well, God, they're starving to death. Okay, because of the past 100 years of livestock grazing, perennial grasses are in short supply. So they're forced to eat those dry annuals during the summer and fall, and that causes all kinds of problems with their potassium storage, and I, you know, I could go on and on. We'll just skip through those, they were running. Anyway, they're eating non-native annual, annuals. Um, that's how big the babies are. This is sort of facts that I, I learned while I was working on all this. Tortoises reach sexual maturity at the same age we do. They live to be about as old as we do. They can go up to three years between drinks of water. In their burrows, they'll dig a little catchment out in front of their burrow, and they can sense, while they're in hibernation in the winter, if there's a little rain, they can sense it, and they will sleepwalk out into their catchment and get a drink and go back in. BLM is still schizophrenic, very schizophrenic. It's going to be a while, but you guys can change that. <clears throat> the condition of the rangeland is not too good. The condition of the ecosystems is not too good, but you guys can fix it. Just get involved with your nonprofit organizations. Choose a career in natural resource management. BLM are going to have to be a little tough and but there's a difference between personal opinion and professional judgment, and the judgment's based on education, training, and experience, and science, and just be persistent. Thank you.